Hi, this is Cliff Rillick. I'm Executive Director of Cinema St. Louis. Uh, last year at the 30th Annual Whitaker St. Louis International Film Festival, we presented a tribute to Mary Strauss, uh, one of our staunchest supporters over the years, uh, on November 21st. Uh, we wanted to offer those who couldn't attend the event an opportunity to see the various video tributes that we put together on Mary's behalf, and so we're going to be presenting those momentarily. Um, there are three pieces. Um, all three of which were put together uh, by uh, Wyatt Mead and Gail Gallagher of Pirate Pictures. We want to thank them for their uh, invaluable contributions here. Uh, the first is a compilation of nine network interviews uh, that have been done by Patrick Murphy. We thank him and Nine Network uh, for sharing this material uh, with Mary. Uh, concentrating on Fox, uh, the Fox Theater is by far and away the a thing that Mary is most associated with here in St. Louis, although her uh, many contributions to St. Louis uh, range far beyond that. But at any rate, we offer a little bit of insight into uh, the origins of the Fox restoration and what took place in the years following, uh, thanks to that material. In addition, we did a new interview with Mary uh, in which she sort of unpacked her love of movies and the various uh, movie related activity that she's been engaged in over the years. Uh, so that's next. And then the last piece is a tribute to Mary uh, by a variety of friends and colleagues who uh, sort of expand on all the various things that Mary has done uh, in her life and the many contributions that she's made to the St. Louis community. I just wanted to offer a few words of thanks uh, on a personal level uh, to Mary. Uh, I'm exiting actually as the executive director of Cinema St. Louis this year. <clears throat> and uh, without her help and support over the 19 years that I've been associated with the organization, I could not have possibly done my job in the same way. Um, she has been with Cinema St. Louis almost from its outset. Uh, she was a board chair. She was a programmer. She did lots of great programming, as you'll see in these videos uh, for the festival. Uh, she was <clears throat> a supporter throughout, uh, financially and also an enthusiastic attendee. So uh, uh, on a personal level, um, she's somebody who's hugely important to me. And she is, I think, to many people in the St. Louis area, uh, whether you know her or not, um, she has actually contributed uh, immensely to your betterment. Uh, that said, uh, we're going to now show the three videos and then at the conclusion, we'll offer a little picture of uh, the actual award presentation. Um, it will feature Mary, uh, myself, and uh, my longtime colleague, Chris Clark, our artistic director, who's known Mary even longer than I have. Thank you, enjoy. The style is called Siamese Byzantine, which is just a little bit of everything. The era of the movie palace was the 20s. People went to movies and they went to the venues. They didn't care what was playing. So the movie houses wanted to get bigger and grander to attract people. The first movie palaces were basically Renaissance and Baroque palaces, very classical. As the era moved on, you had to go beyond that. And so they became, as I call it, ostentatiously glorious and a little bit of everything. And that's why you have the Oriental in Chicago, you have the Egyptian, and we have the fabulous fox, which is a little bit of Babylonian, Deco, Egyptian, Indian, you name it. There's a little bit of everything here. A young developer, Joe Carpenter actually, he was young then, uh, wanted Leon to look at the Humboldt building with him. And Leon kept procrastinating and then one day Joe said to Leon, well if you come look at the Humboldt we can get into the Fox Theater because it's all owned by the Arthurs. So it was January, it was really cold and Leon called me and said, would you like to have some fun this morning? 
And I said, what? And he said, let's go. We're going to look at the Fox Theater. And I grew up in St. Louis. Everyone went to the Fox. It was part of my childhood. We had flashlights, one light burning. We toured the Fox with these flashlights. We got up on the stage and we looked out and I kept pulling on Leon and saying, is this not fabulous, Leon? And Arthur was saying, this is the last year we're gonna heat the building. We're just gonna let it go because we can't afford to keep it going anymore. I kept saying, Leon, this is fat. We have to do something about this. I'm a very determined person, little but determined. And so I kept nudging him for months saying, Leon, don't forget. And he finally started making inquiries, got three partners at the time, and we went around to buy it from the Arthurs and they were all over the country. It was in the summer then of 1981 and uh, he said, well, I th you're going to work, we just got the Fox. We really didn't know what we were gonna do with it, but we wanted to save it. We wanted to restore it because we felt that St. Louis deserved having one of its movie palaces left because they were being torn down. And so we didn't do feasibility studies. We were just determined and knew that we could pull it off. Many people said, it's a white elephant. What are you doing? Nobody will come. And we didn't believe them. Leanne and I had one trait very similar is if you really believe in something, work on trying to make it happen, not give all the reasons why it can't happen. And it was a really wonderful experience restoring the theater. I learned more than I ever thought I wanted to know because besides the mechanical and the electrical and the roof, which were here but not functioning very well and everything had to be done, I really wanted to restore. And restore means bringing this theater back as close as possible to what it had been originally. And that meant not modernizing, not painting things white, and that meant keeping that mustard color and that meant just making it wonderful. The restoration was broken into segments and so the first thing we did was we did the lower and men's ladies lounges and the lobby and then we started having parties here for charities and so that people got used to coming to the Fox. They saw where they could park, they saw it was okay and so as the momentum kept growing, once it opened, it wasn't such a big deal anymore. So I went to work on the restoration of this theater uh, the day after school started for my kids, and we opened one year later with Barnum the day they went back to school, September 7th. When they all had it restored, she called me out there and she says, we want you to come back and be at the console for the grand opening. We can't have the grand opening without you. That well, I was in seventh heaven. I said, oh my, well, I love to do that. Of course, I, I got here pronto. Well, the first night I came up, people were sitting on the stage and they would talk to me. Hello, Stan. Oh my goodness, it's so good. I couldn't stop and talk to them. I'm playing the organ, you know. And a few people told me as the organ made its appearance through the pit, we sat there and we cried. It brought back such wonderful memories and we were so thrilled by the sound. I said, that's what, not what I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to make you cry. I was trying to make you happy. They said, we couldn't help it. It was such a thrilling thing to be in the Fox Theater again and see the organ and hear the organ come up. It took us back 20, 25 years to when we were young. Opening week, um, it was interesting to, to stand out in the lobby and listen to people as they came in. Of course, the first people, everyone just looks up at the ceiling and says, oh my gosh. But I heard this man, and he walked in, he looked around, he says, big deal, big deal. It looks like it always did. And I said, we're a success, we did it. Him not knowing, he didn't have any idea of the destruction that had been here that we had to bring it back. But we had succeeded. You see something and you see the potential. I'm very proactive. I think we can do anything we want to do in St. Louis. I hate waiting around for the East Coast or the West Coast to do something and we follow. We can be leaders if people and organizations and the city would just move forward. I still meet people today that say they haven't been to the Fox, and I ask them if they ever go anywhere, do they ever get off the couch and when watching TV? Because in the 20 years that we have been open, I think we have presented something for everybody.
I love movies and I remember standing on Clayton Road waiting for a bus with my older brother and going to the Esquire and seeing movies all the time. The first movies I went to, I remember is Bambi, Dumbo, and Fantasia cry, cry. Then when I was 12 years old, I had a birth, this is how crazy it was. I had a birthday party and it was Mary Burnett Productions. All along our room in the Rathskeller was photographs of the movie people. I don't know. Uh, so there, that's when it started. Then in seventh grade, I saw Sunset Boulevard and for some reason, and I don't know what it is, I fell in love with the movie and I saw it four or five times, which was ridiculous. And I remember my mother saying, again? <laughs> One thing my mother did, I think, when I was in high school, and I don't know why she did it, I collected movie magazines. So that was my first collection, and she threw them out. I think I went away to camp or something, and she threw them out, and I was just furious. i never forgiven her, okay? <laughs> and then um, when I was at school, Gloria Swanson, Sunset Boulevard, had a uh, clothes collection and she came to Famous Bar and my mother let me skip school and I went down there to meet her. Oh God. <laughs> and that was a real thrill. And then it just multiplied. I am a great collector of Josephine Baker. Posters, photographs, programs, tickets to the programs. And I even have one of her costumes, which she wore. So, and they're very hard to come by. And I love the way she started out as a comedian and turned into a diva. And that was all Pepito, her husband, changed her. She led a really interesting life, but sad ending. She was buried in Monaco with all the honors and everything. And on November 30th, they are moving her to the Pantheon, which is the greatest honor that you can get in France. She's the first black woman, of course, and only one of five that are buried in the Pantheon. Originally, as everyone knows, the Fox was a movie theater. So when we took over the Fox and the restoration and everything, I kept thinking about movies. So when we opened, uh, Leon and I thought it would be a great idea to do um, two movies as a tribute to the old Fox. And we did Valentino and the Eagle and Lon Chaney and the Phantom. We brought Stan Can in from California. He was so great. He was really funny. I have wonderful experiences with him. And his, he got a new car, which wasn't new, but it was new to him. And he tried to put the windshield wipers on and the trunk flipped open, you know, and things like that. It was hysterical. It was gangbusters. I mean, people really loved it. And I stood at the door taking the tickets. Really, the Fox was not ready for it. So I wanted to do a movie series. Now that was before blockbusters. That was before you could actually see classic movies. It wasn't Turner Classic Movies. I don't even think AMC was, you know. So I started Monday nights during the summer because Mondays we didn't have a show and I knew that there, I, I could do it. And um, it was a big success. I did everything from Casablanca to Gone with the Wind. I remember, it was Meet Me in St. Louis. There was a line outside the theater down Washington Avenue past the Sheldon. So it was like going to old time movies. There was an organ concert. There was door prizes. Everyone started coming in costumes. And so I wore costumes to fit the movie. And every year we'd have one live show. It was really a success. I think I did it for seven years. So Dan Rich called me one day. I don't know what he asked me, but I had heard of the International Film Festival. Somehow I became involved and then I got on the board and then I was president. And 
that's the way it goes in my life because I love film. And since I had Monday Night at the Movies, I thought I want to learn more about contemporary films and increase my knowledge. I thought it would be fun to see some like it hot, but also a retrospective of his films. He was an artist, so we got in touch with Caitlin Gallery. He had an art show. We were at Library Limited for his new book. He had a signing, and then we had a fabulous night at the Fox. So I had called him and said, I would love to have one of your paintings. And he said, well, I have one of Marilyn Monroe. And I said, great. I'd heard that there was an Oscar Michaud, and I'd never seen any of his films. And so I thought, how interesting. And then I talked to John Kish, and he got me in touch with people who had the films. And I thought, well, what a great way to see all the films. And Josephine was the film, Catherine Dunham, you know, everybody. And Ruby Dee and Ossie Davis had just written a book and they were on a book tour. So I took all these separate things and I put them into the film festival. So we had the posters of the Urban League and a lot of African-American experts came into town, like Donald Bogle and so forth. We did a tribute to Ruby Dee and Ossie Davis and I brought Mamie Clayton in from Los Angeles. And also we did a really unique thing, I think. We showed Birth of a Nation and then we had a great discussion afterwards. Well, I don't, I don't think you can show a film like Birth of a Nation without a conversation afterwards. It was a great success and it was really interesting, the films we showed. And um, we were really ahead of our time. I love docs. I love to find out people's history, what made them do what they did. And today, <laughs> I only watch documentaries. I am not into superheroes and everything. So the uh, St. Louis Symphony um, commissioned a young composer named Kevin Koska to write a triple concerto for the Eroica Trio of Girls. I learned about it and I thought, what a great thing to bring contemporary music to a younger generation, but it's classical. So we followed the four of them for a year and a half. All the trials and tribulations and joys and everything. Well, I worked with Civil Pictures and was executive producer of The World's Greatest Fair and the St. Louis Arch Reflection of America. The World's Fair the artifacts were at the outdoor pavilion and were crumbling and I had to take them to my house and put them in the basement and store them until I guess Missouri Historical took them over. And that's why I like the World's Fair. I mean, I became very involved in it. That was fun. I, making a rock was not fun. I, I just, it's, it cured me of wanting to be active in. <laughs> okay, and um, but a Rolica, it was picked up by National PBS and shown um, on independent lens and all over the country and um, to embassies they picked it up. It was a really good experience of being just the executive producer. I'm really happy that I've been able to help promote the arts, which are so important. And I especially want to help young people appreciate the arts. I think they are forgotten today. I just think they should have a history of them and make them their own. I heard about Mary before I met her because we lived on parallel streets. Um, first thing I heard was that she's a belly dancer. And then I found out that she was teaching art history at, I think, SIUE, Edward, you know, of Edwardsville. And I thought, oh, 
well, that's a different dimension. <laughs> so I really didn't know who Mary Strauss was. And I think we met in the early 80s working on um, the Central West End house tours. And that was the beginning of hundreds of projects together. She's such an institution in St. Louis. And so I've always known of her, but I actually met Mary through her son, Matt. And one time I was at an event and I don't remember what it was, but I was wearing a vintage dress. I think it was a Mexican vintage dress. And Matt came over to me in the way that he does. And he's like, oh my God, I'm getting a flashback of my mom. And I didn't quite know how to take that because Matt can be, you know, he can be funny. And so I took that as a great compliment, but he kept going on and on. And I said, I really, really need to meet her very soon because obviously she has good taste, so. Through work at COCA, I've known Mary for probably over 15 years, and what I would say about her, what she said about herself, that is she is not the little engine that could, but the little engine who did it, and I love that about her. Mary was just a person that was a standout in St. Louis in the community. Everybody spoke about Mary Strauss, so it was sort of like, who's this Mary, you know? Um, and she did not disappoint, so I can't pinpoint exactly when I met her but she was certainly someone that I was anxious to meet when I moved here. Uh, Mary's my cousin, and I've known her since I was probably two, three years old. We grew up in Arkansas, my sister and I, and our parents would bring us to St. Louis, and we'd stay with my Aunt Florence and Uncle Bob and Mary and Cappy, her brother, and we would uh, have a grand time going to ball games and spending time with Mary and she became kind of a mentor to us both. I first met Mary and Leon actually uh, back when I was at St. Louis University which would have been oh I think we're talking about 1994 1995 and of course I knew who they were and of course knew the Fox being a theater obsessed human being but uh, there was some benefit at the university and Mary and uh, Leon were there and uh, I kind of walked home because they had just announced that they were bringing Angels in America to the Fox, which in the day was an incredibly bold step. I mean, we were still in the throes of AIDS when it was fatal. So to have this play and let people come and do it was a big, um, big deal. So I just walked up to them and, and thanked them. And we got in a wonderful conversation and uh, I thought, oh, she's funny, you know. So we had some good laughs. and. Leon was such a mensch, and we just sort of connected there. So that was the first time I met her. Anyone who knows me well knows that I come up with ideas all the time. Mary, I have an idea. And you know, a lot of people are my Ethel in, in life, but Mary was a kindred Lucy because she also has ideas. And the thing that I, I, I when I say we're kindred spirits, I believe that because I truly believe in having the ideas but then seeing them fulfilled. You know, they come to fruition and Mary is all about that. The reason she's such an important figure is she's guts. She has real guts. You know, she looked in a broken hole and said, wait a minute, we can't lose this and I think this can be something. And with the St. Louis Film Festival and you know countless organizations for early on, she said, no, I see something, I believe in something, let's do what it takes to make it happen. And cities and communities do not exist without those kinds of people. So many things about Mary that are unique, but I would highlight her vision, her passion, her openness, her high bar, and her huge heart. COCA was a small organization with a big ambition when Mary became involved. Dance was a lead discipline, but it was very important for theater to be a part of the multidisciplinary vision and model. Mary got involved and agreed with this and loves theater, of course, and so became the presenting sponsor of COCA's Summer Youth Musical. Her name alone lent enormous credibility to the organization, to the program, but it also really set a high bar for the performers and the staff. And with Mary involved, everyone wanted to, to, to go to the next level. Well, she's real. Uh, she's open, she's comfortable with herself, and so because of that, you're comfortable being around her. And she's also very inclusive. 
I mean, she has these very stern values and principles that I think guide her life. Um, uh, but you would think someone like that would be, I don't know, obstinate or, or unflexible. But on the contrary, she really pulls you in. I know, you know, I worked at the theater for about three or four months, and I didn't really want to disturb her because she was the queen bee. <laughs> so I'd always go through the president and that. And one day she just came up to me and she said, Tom, why is it that you never talk to me about things? She's the donor to all of the large institutions. If you look in your programs when you're at the symphony, the art museum, the rep, the uh, opera theater, all of that. But what you don't know is that she gives to hundreds of small organizations that you, you would never see her name given, especially um, animal protection and rescue organizations. You know, she just puts her mind to something, gets it done. I mean, the whole restoration of the Fox Theater, her love of the arts, her support of the arts, um, her support of young performing artists and young designers. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. So an example of Mary uh, getting involved in something pushing forward this past uh, spring, the American Ballet Theater, which is really the iconic national ballet of our country, decided to do a cross-country tour. And this was a COVID uh, strategy for them, where they were going to repeat something they did back in the 40s, which was a cross-country tour stopping in eight to 10 cities. And they had selected St. Louis to potentially be one of these cities, alongside Chicago, Minneapolis, Washington, DC, New York. So obviously there were funds involved and making this happen. And Mary saw this as a great opportunity for St. Louis to be on the map. And also the thing was that they were going to do these performances for free. So here in this summer after COVID or COVID winding down, at the end of the day, 3,000 people were able to see American Ballet Theater in Forest Park. And Mary was a big part of making that happen. Oh, she's relentless. She's relentless and it's fantastic. What a great lesson. She's not gonna take no for an answer. What are you kidding? You Mary Strauss calls. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, you're done, you're baked. That's what it's how it works. And it's fantastic. And you gotta be, you know, we need those people. We need her. You know, that's the best. I you know, I hope someday when people go, Oh, it's Isaacson, I guess I gotta do it, you know? I'm like, yeah. I really love the fact that Mary Strauss is not afraid of working hard. You know, Mary delegates well, but she will never ask anyone to do anything that she wouldn't do herself, and that's the truth. She is in the trenches. When I went to Mary to tell her I wanted to start a Tennessee Williams Festival here, of course she said, go for it. And she was fully supportive in so many different ways, not just financially, but and as a very strong board member, but just cre creatively as well. You know, one of my greatest joys is when we got the award for best arts startup in 2019 from the Arts and Education Council of St. Louis. And uh, walking on stage with Miss Mary to get the award hand in hand was a real thrill. It really was. She's my champion. I think that Mary tells a story herself, and, and I know this is to be true, uh, is that they both went down to the Fox on a Sunday to see it, and it was in terrible, terrible shape, needed to be completely restored. And I don't even know if there was electricity. I, I think she said they went in with hard hats and, and flashlights, and she said, I want you to get this and we're going to renovate it. And, you know, God bless Leon, <laughs> he said yes. And look what we have because of her. I've got an idea. He believed in her. She believed in the vision. And so Leon would say, I gave Mary an unlimited budget and she exceeded it. You know, the thing she understood about the Fox is not only is it an extraordinarily amazing, beautifully bizarre building. I mean, I always called it Byzantine Arm Armageddon. You just kind of went, what happened here? Which is thrilling, and you don't have things like that in the world. I mean, you know, you have to look at it in, in a historical sense. You know, you go to Europe, and all these kinds of buildings are venerated, and you take tours. And she saw that, like, oh, no, this is part of an important idea 
of a city, community, history, or culture, we have to preserve this. And it being here for St. Louis for, you know, forever, you know, the, the time value and understanding of that is just gonna get greater and greater. What not many people know about is Mary's brilliant idea to start the Fox Performing Arts Charitable Foundation. Then grants were given to performing arts organizations. But a few years back, Mary decided that if we focused on young people, that that could have a lasting impact. So now we have many programs through the foundation. The big one is the Teen Talent Competition, and that is one of the most exciting nights of the year. And then from that, there are workshops and master classes. The teenagers get college tuition, and it's just an amazing program. And I think that in future years in New York, they're gonna say, well, that Broadway star is from St. Louis. She's from St. Louis. What's in the water in St. Louis to make all this talent? And it all goes back to the foundation, and the foundation goes back to Mary. She has um, an energy in terms of business and in terms of renovation, and she helped not only develop the Fox Theater, but really the renovation and the understanding of what needs to surround the Fox. So it's her brain children always talking about, well, what do people want to do before going to the theater and after? And she will, you know, decide that, you know, people might want to grab a bite to eat, they might want a glass of champagne afterwards, and she really just pulls her sleeves up and gets involved in the civic organization of that. And that is something that is a special talent to be able to cross both disciplines of what do people want and how do we get this done. If Mary and Leon hadn't gotten involved, the Fox Theater probably would be brick somewhere else now. And um, I went on a personal note, I remember when it, the party, when it opened, and one of the great ballet dancers, Nureyev, happened to be performing in St. Louis that week. And he came over to see what they had done. And Leon and Mary walked him through it and I tagged along. And I remember seeing the look on his face. Well, in 2011, Mary came to me and said, do you know what's happening next year? What is the anniversary of? And I said, well, I'm not sure. And she said, it's the anniversary of the Titanic. She said, well, I actually went to a dinner at the Seelbach in Louisville several years ago, and I'd like to replicate that. And I said, well, oddly enough, I've done that dinner eight or nine times felt pretty proud of myself that I knew something about this. And I actually helped with that dinner at the seal, seal box. So we could do it right here. Uh, and I said, in fact, I've done it eight times. And one time I did it for 80 people. Now 80 people doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're doing 10 courses, a four hour dinner that's so long and has an intermission is pretty overwhelming. And Mary says, well, I wanna do it for the exact amount of people that actually had that dinner on the Titanic. And I said, well, that's over 300 people. She says 327. And, and that exemplifies Mary. You have an idea, but she has a whole much bigger idea. Let's make a weekend of it. And pretty soon we had an exhibition at the uh, History Museum. We did a brunch after the huge dinner at Tom House. And we replicated this just like it was a theatrical production. I've gone to more movies and plays with Mary than even my husband. Mary Strauss truly loves movies, the cinema. And anyone who knows Mary well, or maybe not even that well, knows that she collects movie memorabilia. She has this beautiful collection of costumes that are just breathtaking. And, you know, I really believe she can open a museum tomorrow of real note, just with what she's personally collected over the years. When she first started the Fox, she actually had Monday night movies. And she would get into character. So if we were showing 
You know, uh, the Wizard of Oz, she'd dress up like Dorothy. And actually, I think she attributes her ability to feel good about talking in front of people and being more open to the fact that she hosted those Monday night movies uh, for about a year when the Fox first opened. I grew up loving film, especially old movies, with, and I watched them with my mom all the time. So I thought I knew a little bit about film. I know nothing. I know absolutely nothing compared to Mary. When Mary was uh, involved with this film festival, it was a fledgling organization at the time, and she really helped move it, I think, into a uh, much more substantial part of uh, St. Louis, which we all in, you know, still enjoy. She has a great eye for talent and movies and fun things that you would want to do and see. And I think uh, she brought that to the organization. Years ago, she brought Tony Curtis in. It was early, it was like the third or fourth year. And again, going from more of an indie, European, Latin American uh, festival of, you know, it was, it was an international festival right off the bat, but Again, we were not at all mainstream those first few years. So, you know, all of a sudden, I'm sitting next to Tony Curtis having lunch at the art museum. I love when Mary sees a new film or has previewed some of the film festival offerings and just her level of enthusiasm is like no one else. And she also has this love of vintage Hollywood and she brought that flavor to the film festival. Uh, so I think because of Mary's influence, there's now more of um, an amalgam of uh, different kinds of films and maybe something more for everybody. Mary's unique because she can be really tough when she's working on a project that she believes in but she's so tender-hearted. Um, she has a warming light on her back porch for all the animals, the feral animals in the neighborhood. I mean, this, this warming thing goes on all winter. One night I saw a raccoon and a, an opossum eating out of the same dish. And for a long time, she had a wild turkey that wouldn't let the mailman come up the driveway. <laughs> Sex in the City, that we all remember, was having its last episode, and it was my brilliant idea to do a fundraiser, show it at the Ritz-Carlton St. Louis, and P.S., uh, I got in trouble with whoever the network was in New York. The lawyers were calling everything you can't do, it, copyright, I don't even know what it was at the time. Who did I call? Mary, we need a venue, can we please come over? And 140 people later, we came over, we did the fundraiser, we showed it on screens. I mean, that's just how she is. One afternoon, I do remember when um, Cameron Silver, who's known as the king of vintage, he owns Decades in LA, which is this big vintage store on Melrose, came to St. Louis for some trunk. I've done so many, God only knows what it was. But anyway, I said, I have a special surprise for you. We're gonna go see this incredible collection at Mary Strauss's. And we walked up to the third floor and he was totally blown away. And he's not easily blown away. I had been in London, and they were doing this thing called the Sing Along A Sound of Music. And Mary heard about this, she's like, oh, let's do that. You know, like, let's do that. You know, you dressed up in costumes and hooting and hollering, and we sold out the Fox. 4,000 people going out of their minds for the Sound of Music in the craziest way. The laughter, the joy. And Mary came up to me afterwards and said, I think that that's one of the greatest nights in the history of the Fox. She really appreciates community having fun, uh, laughter, you know, I mean that was her beautiful relationship with Stan Can, and the hijinks that they would get up to, you know, he really made her laugh. And you know, you'd go over there and the craziest things were going on, you're like, okay Mayor, yeah, let me just step over the vacuum cleaner here. Well, one of my biggest thrills is when Mary's won the Tony Award. And I haven't been there live to see that, but seeing Little Miss Mary on stage on Broadway, you know, look what she's done. Just really look what she's done. Mary worked on the Kevin Klein Awards. And because of some of her connections that first year, 
ceremony was spectacular. And I remember at the end, I was on the board, and I think Mary was the president of the board, and they wanted the board on stage to have a picture with Kevin Klein. And so we're all standing up there, and Kevin Klein isn't there. And finally, he comes strolling in, and Mary says, where were you? <laughs> And he said, I went outside to have a cigarette. And she said, well, we've been waiting. So one thing that um, I don't know if everyone knows about Mary is that she was a Playboy bunny in the Playboy Club. And she could rock her bunny tail. And she looked amazing. It was gorgeous. And I mean, talk about the glamour and sophistication. Well, I understand others have have disclosed that Mary was a, at one time a Playboy bunny. And when she was, I was a, a freshman, also a senior in high school, at, uh, but a freshman at Washington U. And so the fact that my cousin was actually a bunny and could uh, help us, you know, go over and get in there was made, it was a very attractive uh, feature that she had at the time. Would I be surprised, to, you know, if you told me now, by the way, you know, Mary was a Playboy bunny? It makes absolute sense because she was fearless and it probably sounded like fun. So if it sounds like fun, let's give it a shot. What would St. Louis be missing without Mary? Well, we wouldn't have the Fox Theater, the fabulous Fox. We wouldn't have her amazing taste that went into the Fox Theater, we would be a much smaller city, I think, in terms of who we can strive to be. I don't think we would have the audacity, um, the enough audacity to just sort of be who we want to be and showcase the glamour and to showcase things like beauty and elegance, a time that has gone by, the sort of golden years of Hollywood, and to dream. If we didn't have Mary, we would not be able to dream as much as we can. The city of St. Louis would be a big, dark hole <laughs> without Mary and some others, but Mary plays a huge role in the arts and culture of our city, which I we need more than ever, honestly, for all she has done, for all of her accomplishments, for all the people that she has touched. She doesn't ask for a thing. She is the loveliest, kindest woman. And, you know, some people are out there pushing it to move here, do that, move, shake, blah, 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 blah. Not with Mary Strauss. She's the real deal. Mary Strauss is the kind of person who understands that when you find the energy to support a creation or creative people, that that becomes something, that then becomes something, that then becomes something, that, be, you know, like, that is essential. And it's so hard to do that initial thing. Everyone wants, no, that's not a good idea. Why would you do that theater in Midtown? Why would you, you know, like, you see something nobody else can see. But you understand once it's in place and you work really hard and you make it successful, there's a bigger conversation in place. There's families coming through the Fox. There's artists coming through the Fox. There's all of that. There's all the people in the film festival who put it together, the artists they're working with, the audiences that come, how they connect with each other. That's the best of life. That's the best of life. One of the special things about Mary is how much she values friendships. She cherishes her friends and she keeps them forever. She nurtures them. She never forgets a birthday. If you've had some kind of achievement, she's the first one to congratulate you. And she's so supportive in everything. She's always asking about your projects and she is a true friend's friend. You know, Mary's probably best known as a uh, benefactor to the arts. But really, the way I look at Mary is, uh, is that she builds community through the arts. She loves diversity. She respects other people's positions. And even though you're working on her dream, she allows you space to enter into that dream and do some things yourself. Um, 
So in that way, she's very open. She's very open to new ideas. Uh, she's someone that is never stagnant. She's always, always moving. In thinking about Mary and her love for the movies, I thought about Oscar-winning movies and this little tribute just for her. So Mary, thanks to you, ordinary people have been touched by the arts. You've danced with wolves to get things done and sometimes felt the sting of it. However, you've never been silenced by the lambs in your endless pursuits. Mary, your good looks could have made you a Bond girl, but thank goodness you wanted to do more. Because of your support for COCA, a growing theater program wasn't gone with the wind, but rather you put the greatest shows on earth on the COCA stage, including your own Little Dancer. Mary, you will forever be the godmother of arts and culture in St. Louis, and I'm thrilled that the film festival is putting this spotlight on you.